Hello, this is Jeffrey Pfeffer for the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Accelerating Your Career. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Sarah Buchner. Sarah, I met uh, when she was a student in my uh, Pass to Power class at Stanford um, in the MBA program. She has a PhD um, from Austria, uh, which she is going to describe. And in fact, what I want to do first is begin by t having Sarah uh, tell us about her background. Many people believe that everybody who comes to Stanford is from a rich or very, you know, high status family. Sarah is in, in enormous ways a self-made individual. So why don't you begin by telling us a little about, you know, how you got to Stanford, your career prior to Stanford, and then we'll talk about some things about what you learned in the class and how you've applied power very successfully to your career. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Um, I, yeah, I started my career when I was 12 years old, actually, like in my early teenager years in Austria. So I grew up in a family of, like, I think in America, we call this first generation. So my parents didn't go to college and my dad was a carpenter. And so he taught me early on how to do carpentry. And I guess he needed cheap labor and I needed money. So I started as a carpenter in my teenager years. And yeah, I well, was a little blonde girl working on a construction site and just kind of like, you know, I think this is really when the power game started because I knew in order to be accepted there, I needed to present myself with power and show up in a way that, you know, delivering real results, but also not letting anybody else talk over me. And then from there on, it was just like a path throughout yeah, mostly always construction, but also I pretty much did any job that would make me money. I worked on Oktoberfest as a waitress. I did all sorts of stuff, but it always came back to the construction industry because it was fascinating to me. And I also actually liked being the outside in this world. So I worked my way up in construction. I um, then ended up having a teacher telling me that I should probably consider college because they thought I was smart enough to do this. So in order for me to like, you know, get to college, I always had to work. And so I worked full time all my life and I did all these degrees while I kept on working. So I have like an undergrad and two master's degrees in kind of like civil engineering and related fields and ultimately ended up, as you mentioned before, doing a PhD in civil systems engineering and data science which um, I, again, did while I kept working in the construction industry and building a brand name for myself of like actually having work experience while doing degrees. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. And it's a, it is a wonderful and important trajectory. Speak a little bit more for those people who don't know what your PhD is in. And also speak a little bit about how you always use in your email signature, Dr. Sarah Buchner. The way I came about to do a PhD, like first early on in my life, I, I always wanted to be somewhere else. I always wanted to, like, I always dreamt really big and I thought I could make it really big. And part of this dream was to have a PhD. And so in Europe, the PhD is a little bit like the MBA in America. So in order to get high up in a corporate career, you almost needed a PhD, especially as a woman. So I convinced a large corporation I worked for to like finance my PhD and like get me in and help me do this. And then once I was finished, I was like, I did it in half the time that normal PhDs take. Um, I did it in a field that nobody has ever done before. I did an industry PhD, which in Europe is something they really don't like because they think people should eat it in school or eat it in business. I always did both. And so I think part of me is just proud that I did this, but then another part, it's also just like good branding. So I started using the doctor in my signature while I was still in Europe and I kept it in the US and I realized that people really appreciate that because they don't see it that often. And it's also with my last name sounding very German, there's something about having a doctor from Germany that people here just consider as being something, you know, something real good engineering comes from Germany. And so I will keep my doctor in my signature for as long as I can. One of the things your answer, I think, illustrates, and then we're going to go on to the lessons from the class that you've applied in your life. But uh, one of the things that you're already, your answer speaks to is this idea of breaking the rules and standing out. Many people, of course, want to fit in. Uh, but of course, the secret to success is differentiating yourself. And you, you began that early in your life. 
So you took past the power. You did very well in the class. You used it with your startup, which we can't talk about because it's in stealth mode and we can't, we can't, I guess, talk about many things, but there are some things that I think we probably can talk about. So if I were to say to you, what did you learn from the class and from the book that you have found useful as you've launched your startup and are willing to talk about? So for one of the things, for instance, you mentioned is, um, this idea of building connections, of, of networking. Talk about some of what you did about that. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of stuff I learned through your class and through reading your two books, especially your new books, The Seven Rules of Power, where I feel like I've always been doing those things. But now it's I feel like more encouraged to keep on doing these things. And I'm more strategic about it now than I've been early in my career. I think one of the points you touched on is like, network like relentlessly and I started this like super early on I think it was like in my early 20s where I was trying to um, get into like a better and bigger construction company and so the way I did this I was writing a master thesis and I was like okay you know you could just write about a topic but I decided to do a master thesis that is pretty much like a networking game So I um, did interviews and I told every CEO in Europe that I need to interview them for this master thesis. And so I reached out and I, you know, got some of them through cold intros, some of them through warm intros. But every time I had one, I asked them to introduce me to two other people. And so then it's like almost like a tree, right? And so it keeps on building. And obviously everybody wants to be helpful and wants to help you even further. So some of them would try to introduce me to higher up people or like people from like bigger companies. And so I ended up with like really high powered people and it was like almost like a Rolodex when my master thesis was a Rolodex of like powerful construction people. And I couldn't get this one person I really wanted. And he was like the C-level executive of the biggest company in Europe and one of the biggest ones in the world. And so I ended going to um, a like networking event or like conference and I saw him getting dinner at the buffet and I just walked up to him and I was like, excuse me to interrupt I think you missed my email and he was like very shocked while he was like obviously putting food on his plate and he was like yeah like like, who are you and I was like yeah I'm Sarah I'm writing this like super important math diseases and you know I got a warm intro to you and you never responded and obviously the rest is kind of like history but he over the years like first I got an immediately on job in his company um, a very prestigious one I worked my way up and he became one of my closest mentors through the years because and he told me years later he was just very impressed by the forwardness and then he decided that this is what it takes in a good leader to actually like get out of your own way I think this is also one of the lessons from your book it makes you uncomfortable in the moment but it might really really pay off and so the way I think about it now is like yes I get rejected like maybe five times but the five times that I'm not getting rejected is creating a pool of opportunities that is so much more worth than the five times rejection. Yeah, thank you. That's a great story. And that leads into the second thing that you talked about, about the class, getting out of your own way. And I love the boldness of walking up to this guy. And not only the boldness of walking up, but basically walking up and being a little bit aggressive about it. Like, you know, I'm Sarah, and you didn't answer my email. That's a great example. The other thing that I think you've been very strong on and that I talk about in Seven Rules of Power is branding. You've you've built a very, very excellent uh, I think a very strong personal brand. Part of that is how you show up, uh, but part of that is also beyond how you show up. So speak a little about what you've done with respect to branding yourself, both both in terms of appearance and, and acting with power, but also how you've built a brand. Yeah, I think the acting with power piece is probably the first one that I learned. Um, so I got my first job outside of the carpentry, like my first real job in construction after being a carpenter because of my strong handshake. And so the way it came about, I was way too young to apply for this job. And I came in and I, I mean, I had strong hands because I was a carpenter and I was a waitress carrying like 14 steins of beer on Oktoberfest. But it was also just something that I read early on that all these politicians do these like strong handshakes and whose hand is on top or not. And so I came in and I just gave a very strong handshake. And I learned two months later that the reason why I got the job was the handshake. And so that kind of like stuck in the back of my brain. And over the years, I also, I think I developed just a like strong way of walking and showing up and kind of like owning the room whenever I can. So I think I, I, this is like acting with power and just like, you know, not letting anybody talk over me or always thinking I have a seat on the table, even so there might be board meetings where I was definitely like too young to be in. 
And then to the appearing powerful, I I have a very distinct like European style, I guess, and I would never change that because it is something people will remember and don't forget, especially in an industry where everybody else is a man over 50. I'm like the only woman anyways, but then I'm a woman who dresses in business clothes 24-7, um, I wear heels a lot, even so I'm 5'9 naturally, just to be taller than most of the people in there. Um, and I'm trying to create a picture that people have hard times forgetting. And quick story here, actually, it just comes to my mind right now. The first uh, business cards I ever had, I printed my own business cards when I was like 20, 21, something like this, and wrote this like master thesis. And the business card had my name on it, but it also had a picture of me on it. And everybody thought it was ridiculous that I would have business cards with my picture on it. But also, nobody ever forgot that. And so it's just important to connect like my name with like an appearance or like to create this brand. And I am my brand. So I, yeah, I think I'm trying to do this over clothes. I'm trying to do this over handshake and acting with power. And then I'm also trying to do this over storytelling. So this whole thing of like, yes, I'm a self-made tradeswoman that you know, went up getting a PhD and an MBA from Stanford. And now I'm defining myself as the queen of construction. That might sound weird to people, but it makes people never forget that. Yes. And that's, and the idea of not being, uh, being forgotten is, is of course very crucial. I very much, uh, I very much appreciate the story. If I were to ask you, so, so your brand, I think you've just answered is your brand is you are the queen of construction. For now. Yes. For now. Okay. That's a, that is, that is a good brand. I like that. The final thing I wanted to ask you about, as you said in your email to me, you also think that you're quite consistent with the idea of chapter seven of the, the seventh rule, which is that success excuses many things. Can you give some examples from your own experience about how your success, you know, in getting the PhD and in getting the Stanford MBA and in doing these other things have helped you actually activate or actuate the success excuses everything idea? So I think like I very much buy into like success excuses almost everything. And I think I was definitely like, successful so far in my life. I don't yet have like a lot of stuff I have to find excuses for, um, but that might come. But what I more relate to with this is that also like when I grew up, I felt disadvantaged for sure. And I was always like, OK, like, why can't I be like a billionaire's kid? Why can I not just my parents didn't go to Ivy League. They didn't even go to college. But like, you know, growing up, it was like it would be so much easier. And I actually really find this recently. I think actually my growing up the way I did and not having like everything given to me helps me a lot every single day. And I think it's a huge advantage right now that I probably have also over people that study with me or that are in my field right now. It's for sure like a chip on my shoulder, but a, a chip that comes with like self-induced pressure and not like pressure from the family or from the outside world. Like I, in the sense of like my family and my, you know, the village I grew up in, I outperformed every expectation when I was 20 years old. Like I earned more money than like my, my family together, like in my mid twenties. And it's, it's just like from there on, everything I could do was like, it wasn't pressure anymore. It's just like something I do for myself. And that actually for me redefines risk a lot. Like we have these discussions at Stanford where we're like, oh, do like, people with like a privileged background or like a trust fund or whatever should they be the real entrepreneurs because they have the flexibility to do and to try and to like you know risk more and I would very much counter Oregon would say I actually think like not coming from this world makes you de redefine risk in a way that makes you probably like more willing to go the extra mile and not just from a like grind and like work ethic perspective but I think like for me, making $100,000 a year is like, you know, a life that is well lived and I and everything from there is upside. And that is very different to like somebody who has the pressure to like, you know, make $100 million because their parents made $100 million. And so I think like growing up kind of like underprivileged and scrappy is right now a huge advantage. And I'm trying to even create this culture in my current company where we are scrappy and we are grinding, but that is what makes us successful. And I'm not saying that people from privileged backgrounds can't do this. I just think it's a very different chip on their shoulder. Thank you for that. That was a great answer. Are there any other lessons from the class that you want to talk about or... 
Um, yeah, I think there is there's one lesson that I really just got through the class and it is pretty much like around networking and networking in the right way and going a little bit out of your way to do so. And I've always loved networking and I think it's it's incredibly important for everybody's career. But I think you taught us in class that like maybe you need to take an extra flight and go and meet somebody in person. And I did this as as you know, I did this like literally a few weeks after you taught us this and I flew to meet like a very important and powerful C-level executive in the construction industry. And I just flew there for like 12 hours just to meet them in person. And it helped me a lot. It helped our company a lot. It helped me in like so many regards of my life so far. And I could have just done a Zoom call. But the connection that you build when you meet people in person and when you show them that you care enough to fly across the country to meet them, it just builds a different baseline. And I think this is just something I have never heard before. And I think it's like like fundamentally true and very valuable. Okay, thank you for that. So, Sarah, what is your favorite story about a time when you acted really boldly and inappropriately, maybe even to the extent, you know? Um, I don't think it's I act inappropriately. I think I act a little bit out of what people are used to. I think the favorite story that comes to my mind is like it was one of the first board meetings I ever attended and I was like invited as like a digitization expert and it was like, you know, board meeting in a construction company, so a room full of older white men and me. Uh, and I was in my 20s and uh, I show up there all prepared, all ready to talk business because that's what we're supposed to do in a board meeting. And one of the board members came up to me in kind of like half private and was like, Sarah, do you really need to wear like black nail polish in a board meeting? And I just looked at him and I was like, do you really need to wear such an ugly tie in a board meeting? <laughs> And so it was just like, and then we were done. And the conversation, we never had a conversation again about what I was wearing or what I was like, what nail polish I was wearing. And it was a situation where I felt like, you know, it was like totally, he over, totally overstepped his boundaries. And I was like, the only reaction in a case like this for me is to like, just be as direct back as he was to me. Thank you. That's a great story. So this has been uh, the Pfeffer on Power podcast, and today we've been talking with Dr. Sarah Buchner about her path to power, and which is going to continue with her startup, and uh, which is you know just in its in its beginning phases. Uh, please subscribe and listen to future episodes with our many interesting guests, including John Levy and Jason Calacanis, and. Uh, all kinds of interesting people. They're going to talk to you about how to use the principles from Seven Rules of Power to accelerate your career and to get over the idea that uh, the power is not a, a dirty thing. Power is actually the secret to success. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Sarah Buchner. You were fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>